Okay, guys, so I've been asked to do a video or to be pointed to do a video for the genetics problem sets. Um, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, this is from chapter 14. And if you click on the home page in Canvas and scroll down, you'll see that there are right under the the review questions, there are genetics problem sets, which are right here. And you can click on this, and that will give you the problem set. You can download it, or you can look at it in Canvas here. Um, and then if you go back to home, you can also scroll down and see that I have already done the answers, which are here. But I haven't really given an explanation of how I derive them. I mean, I've tried to like draw it out as best as possible so that you can see this, the way that I've derived this, but um, I'm going to go ahead and make a video on using Microsoft Whiteboard to do this as well. So let's start. So the first question says, several black guinea pigs of the same genotype were mated and produced 29 black and 9 white offspring. What would you predict the genotypes of the parents to be? So question number one, um, we're given the parents, we know that they're black guinea pigs. And so we want to know what their genotype is. Remember, the gene is made up of two alleles. So it's going to be um, two letters, according to Mendel. We also are given information about the F1 generation. Um, they had a lot of babies. And so they had 29 black babies and nine white babies. And from looking at this, we can tell already, you know, based on what you've learned, hopefully you've already watched the chapter 14 video and the chapter 13 and the 12 uh, lecture. But what we know is that when we have this F1 generation uh, with a large number of uh, a certain trait or all of a certain trait, then we can assume that that trait is dominant. So it's a pretty safe bet, unless we're proven otherwise, that according to Mendel's rules, black is dominant, and we can use the first letter of that, which is uh, B, and capitalize that, and that will represent the black allele. And if that's the black allele, then the lowercase b would represent the white allele. And in this case, we would assume guinea pigs come in two flavors, black or white. All right, so what we need to do is figure out what the genotypes of the parents are. Now, the parents can be, they we know they're black, so they would have to be big B, big B, um, cross two, big B, big B, or big B, big B, cross two, big B, little B. And it could be the other way around, but it doesn't really matter uh, because it's not telling you that it's sex length, so we don't really care what the sex is we can switch this back and forth and we'd still get the same result. Um, and we know that the it can also be big B, little b, and big B, little b. It can't be, neither, no parent can be little b, but little b because that would make them white. And the problem t uh, tells you that it's not, that both the parents are indeed black. So we can do some crosses Actually, we don't even really need to do that. If we look at this, then you can do the Punnett square. I'll do it real quick. So this is dad's alleles down here. This is mom's alleles across here. And then we just... So mom would make eggs. Dad would make sperm, since these are guinea pigs. They're similar to humans. And then we would get everything would be big B. So we wouldn't get any white. And we did get white. So we can exclude that. That's gone. We don't change colors. That's gone. All right. So the next one we could check is this, which is big B, big B times big B, little B. Um, so we can go ahead and do a punnett square for that. And 
again, we see that every one of these is black. And it wouldn't matter. We could switch mom and dad on different uh, sides of the Punnett square. But regardless, um, it cannot be this because we wouldn't get any white offspring. So we're left with this only is the only possibility. And so we it's pretty safe to assume that the parents are going to be But we can check, double check that based on what we know for statistics. So we do the we can do the Punnett square here. We have big B, little B, big B, little B, and here we would expect all of these to be black. So three force black. And then this one would be little b, little b, so that would be one fourth white. Okay. So we're just need to do some math. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of this and we'll. So we know it's big b, big little b times big b, little b for the parental generation. F one twenty nine black. And, and white. So we can check the math, right? We know that we would expect three fourths to be black for this cross and one fourth to be white. Remember, in science, we don't really use this, so that's three to one ratio. So we can just do some math. Uh, remember, this ratio is part of the whole. So we would expect 75% to be black, 25% to be white. So 29 plus 9, uh, we can do the math on that, and we get 38. So 38. So the percent of black ones would be 29 divided by 38, which gives us 0.7. 763, which is 76.3 percent. We would expect to be black. And 9 out of 38, which gives us 23.7 percent or 0.237. We can check our math. This should add up to 100 percent. And Remember when we're flipping a coin, uh, if we flipped it ten times, it wouldn't come up five times heads and five times tails. There's some uh, amount of uh, variation in statistics that's allowed. Um, and uh, to check this, you could use a chi-square analysis. But um, here, our expected would be three-fourths or 75% black and twenty five percent white, which is really close. These are close to each other. So we can pretty much safely say that this is the genotype of the parents, and that would be your answer. Okay. So on to number two. Heterozygous black guinea pigs are mated to homozygous recessive white guinea pigs. Predict the genotype and ratio expected from back crossing the black progeny to the black parent type. So it's telling you that the that there was a mating and it was done by these genotypes. This one we know from the previous problem is white because they're still guinea pigs. This one is black because it's heterozygous. And so this is our parental generation and our F1. We would um, do the Punnett square. Let's see what we expect. So we have, whoops, little wee, little wee, big wee, little wee. 
So these would be black. We would expect one half to be big B, little b, which are black, and one half to be little b, little b here, um, which are white. Okay. So what it wants to know is what's the genotype and phenotype ratio is expected from back crossing the black progeny to the black offspring. And we're going to back cross it, which means crossing it back to a parent. Um, you can do this in guinea pigs, but not in humans. And then that's why um, pedigrees are really important. So um, we're going to back cross it, the black progeny to the black parent. Here. So we're going to, so this is a different cross. So this is cross number two. And we have big B, little b. And we know, we already know that this is a monohybrid cross. And so we're going to get a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, which means 1 fourth are going to be this, 2 fourths will be this, and 1 fourth will be this. So. Predict the genotypic and phenotypic ratios from back crossing the black progeny to the black parent. All right, so that's just the first part of this. So the genotypic ratio, which is what this is, is a one. Remember, we can just mark off the bottoms. So it's one to two to one. And then cross number three, which is, sorry, it's a terrible three. Cross number three, which is part B. So this is part A, would be the black offspring to the white parent. And then we can do the cross again. So I'm going to erase this. I have some more room, but uh, we'll just remember this is what we're going to solve for here. Black offspring to the white parent. We do the cross. To part B. Big B, little B, little B, little B. So the genotype ratio is one half to one half. And the phenotype ratio is. So one half would be black, these are black, and one half would be white, these are white. So remember we just mark off the bottom. So the ratios would be one to one uh, for the genotype and one to one for the phenotype. All right. Okay, question three. In Drosophila. Okay, so Drosophila are, have a little different nomenclature. Drosophila genetics are unique. Um, geneticists are unique. They don't follow the Mendel rule. What they use is, um, let's say that white eyes is a mutation. So they would to use W. And then let's say red eyes is the wild type so they would use w plus to mean red whereas in mendel's world we would use capital r right because this is dominant and then little r which is recessive so this just means it's the dominant trait wild type trait and this means it's a recessive trait um 
but you can substitute whatever you want for it. It doesn't matter. I don't really follow Drosophila genetics because I don't study fruit flies, nor do I care to, but um, they are important because um, a lot of the stuff, the genes that we've discovered is from Drosophila genetics. I'm just not. I told my graduate uh, professor that when I, she worked on fruit flies and I told her that I would work in her lab, but I wouldn't work on anything without a spine, a spinal cord. So I ended up working on eels instead. But anyway, this is how Drosophila genetics works. So you can do it this way. So this is the mutant. Um, it has sepia eyes, um, which is just a, a color and you can look it up on Google if you want. And so and that's um this is the dominant uh, or wild type, which is actually red. Um and it tells you that in the prompt set. So wild type is red. Sepia eyed females are crossed to pure white type males. So in order to have sepia eyes you have to have both lowercase S's uh, wild type males, that means that they're true breeding, so they have both red alleles. And if you want, we can switch this out to red and sepia, or we can leave it. It's up to you. Um, but if you want to switch this out, just make it this um, little r, little r, because that would be not red. And then wild type would be big r, big r. So either either way you want to do that cross is fine. I'm just gonna I'll stick to the Drosophila genetics for the Drosophila genetics fans. Okay, so they're introducing the males and females here. Um, this is a female, and this is a male. So, um, and that's the symbol for male and female, and you can look at that up too if you want. Um, so we cross sepia eye females to wild type males. What's the phenotypic and genotypic ratios we expect in the F1? So this is the parental generation. F1 generation is here. So we go ahead and do the cross. And you just do it like a normal Punnett square. So over here, I'll do a Punnett square. Uh, I'll put the female on this side and the male on this side. Drosophila are like humans. They make sperm and egg. So the female would make the eggs, and she has both the sepia alleles. Let's fix this here. So we'll, this is sepia, and this is red. S plus is equals red. Okay. So sepia female, and then the male is going to be S plus, and that means that these are red alleles, and males make sperm in Drosophila. So the sperm fertilizes this egg, we get S plus S. This one is S plus S. This one is S plus S. S plus S. So for this problem set, um, All of the F1 offspring are going to be S plus S. So it says what phenotypic and genotypic ratio are expected of the F1 males are then back cross to sepia eyed parental females. So there's some sex in this, uh, but it doesn't say that it's sex linked. And so you don't really need to worry about that. So we're going to cross, I mean, half of these are going to be males and half of these are going to be females and it doesn't really matter what their sex is. So um, we're going to cross this. We'll just take question says, um, F1 males cross to sepia and females. So these are the males. We'll just, you know, half of these are going to be male, half of them will be female. Just like you would expect in humans. 
mean, actually, I think we talked about this. Is like fifty one percent of children born are male, and that has to do with the Y chromosome is wider, so the sperm can travel further faster. Uh, statistically, although there's more females because males have a tendency to do something stupid like, hey, watch this, and then they blow themselves up or kill themselves on accident. So they're bigger risk takers. Anyway, um, so we're going to do this back cross. So we're just, gonna, so this is the, the F2 generation because we're going to, we're back crossing it to a parent. So we have the We're basically crossing son to mom, and so again we can just do a Punnett square. I'm just to save space. I'm gonna erase this. So we have S plus S. This will be the male. So it has this is the sperm Punnett square, and then this one will be S S, and this will be mom, the female. And then we get we just cross them. So this sperm fails this egg. We got S plus S, and we just go down the line. So this is S plus S. This one is S S S S S S. So, um, for the F two, we would expect one half would to be S plus S. Right. Well, two fourths, but that reduces to one half. And then one half would be SS. This would have red eyes. This would have sepia eyes. All right, you just need one red allele to make it red. Um, so this would be, remember we just ignore this. So one to one ratio for the genotype. And then for the phenotype, this would be red. This would be sepia. The ratio is exactly the same, so it's one to one. So this is your phenotypic ratio. This is your genotypic ratio. All right. Any questions? Can't really ask questions. Sorry. All right. Let's go to number four. So number four, short hair is due to dominant. Uh, L, L. I'm just gonna write these out on the side. So L is short. It's kind of weird. Um, you normally think of short hair as being the recessive thing, so it's kind of confusing. But you just gotta keep track of what's going on here from the information that you provided. These are also terrible symbols. So that looks like a one, but it's actually a lowercase L. And this is long and so what it says is that uh, a cross between a short-haired female and a long-haired male produce a litter of one long-haired and seven short-haired bunnies okay so we know from the nomenclature that long hair is dominant i'm sorry short hair is dominant so this is why it's confusing because we normally would think of this as being an S instead of an L. This should, in Mendel's world would be an S, but the question's kind of tricky because it's making this look like the dominant trait, even though it's not. So that kind of tripped me up for a second too. So short hair is due to dominant L allele. So we're, we have a short haired female. So the so the female has short hair, it's dominant. So it could be big L, big L, right? Which would give you short or big L, little L, which would also be short. And then the male is, um, let's see. Male is long haired, so the male has to be little l, little l, because that's the only way that you could get long hair. All right, so let's do this. We don't know the female. I mean, we can guess. Um, 
but we don't really know for sure. And but we do know the male. The male for sure, this genotype is the little, 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 which is uh, recessive long hair. And then we have the F1, which we are given that there are one long haired, which is recessive. So this one has to be little, 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 little is its genotype. And then um, seven short haired. And again, we don't know what this is. This could be big L, little L, or big L, big L for short hair because that's not it. So what are the genotypes of the parents? Okay, so we know the dad. It did super easy. The mom, we know she could be either one of these. So we just do some squares. So let's assume that mom is big L or big L. Dad is little L, little L. We do the cross. Every one of these is uh, has a big L, so they're short. So we couldn't possibly get we couldn't get this from this cross. So it's kind of easy. We get one long one, and that means mom has to be mom has to be. Um, Big L, little L. So that's part A. Then part B, what gene typical ratio is expected in the offspring generation? Okay. So from this cross, then we just, we just all we have to do is do another Punnett square. See what we expect. So we know mom is big L, little L. We know dad is the little L, little L. And we do the cross. And so we would expect from this cross um, that we would get one half short and one half long. Which would be a one to one ratio. So that's part B. Um, how many of the eight bunnies were expected to be long-haired? Well, so if we if we know that uh, long hair is little l, little l, sorry, little l, little l should be fifty percent from part B. Then all we have to do is multiply 0 0.5 times 8 total bunnies, which would give us 4. So we would expect 4 of those bunnies to be um, long-haired. And then, again, we would expect 4 of those bunnies to be uh, short-haired as well. Right. So number 5... Question five says. So question five says, um, dominant little W produces wire hair in dogs. So let's write those over here. And recessive allele W is smooth, little W. So Heterozygous white wire haired individuals. Heterozygous are crossed to each other. Each of their offspring is then crossed to a smooth haired animal. So this is the parental <coughs> F1. We know that. Um, When we do the monohybrid cross, we're going to get a, a 3 to 1 ratio. Big W, little W, little W, little W. So, um, 
this is gonna be um, um fourth and a half one fourth and then those are these are all wire here and these are Okay. Determine the so uh, the heterozygous wild hair individuals are crossed to each other, each the offspring across to smooth haired animals. Okay. So each of these offspring are crossed to smooth haired animals, determine the expected genotypic and phenotypic ratios for each of the possible crosses that have happened here. Alright, so we have this cross. This cross and this cross, and we want to know the genotypic and phenotypic ratios for each of the crosses that have happened here. All right, so I'm just going to raise the side, and we can do it here. So cross number one. Homozygous dominant to homozygous recessive to the pound square. So 100% of these for part one, the genotype is going to be big W little w, and 100% of these, or four out of four. Um, are going to be uh, wire hair because they're heterozygous. Okay, so that's the first part. Then the second cross would be. The heterozygote so one half would be little w little w one half would be big w little w um, the, this is the genotypic ratio and then it's the same for the phenotype. These would all be uh, what does it say? This is smooth. This would be wire. So one to one ratio: uh, homozygous uh, recessive to heterozygote, and then one to one ratio: smooth to wired for the phenotype. And then we just do the last one, which is pretty easy. We already know that. Two homozygous recessives are only going to produce homozygous recessives. So again, this is going to be a hundred percent. Sorry. So a hundred percent going to be little w, little w, and that's going to be some. So genotypic, phenotypic ratio, 100%. All right, so that's question five, question six. So question six is sheep. Um, black wool of sheep is the recessive allele little b. Okay. So again, their uh, question is messing with us because it's not following the Mendel rules. Um, we would expect black to be dominant, but it's saying that black is little b and big b is...
white wool, uh, black wool she was due to a recessive little B, and white wool it's to its dominant little big B. So again, they're just messing with this by changing the letters on this. This isn't Fon Mendel's rules. If we were, um, then black would, uh, white would be dominant. So we would use the, the letters W instead of B. So it's kind of just a trick that um, some people do. I didn't write these questions. We came out of a book. So, um, anyway, but it's pretty simple. You just got to just keep in mind that it, they're playing a mental trick on you and it's not following Mendel's rules. So, um, we have the parental generation. The parental generation um, is going to be big B, little b for the male. And that's going to cr be crossed to big B, little b for... The female, because header um, the white uh, buck is crossed to a white U. Both carry the allele for black, so we know that white is dominant. So we they have to be headers, I guess. Um, they produce a white buck lamb. All right. Well, we would expect that because uh, in the F one generation, we would expect this when we do the cross out. We don't need to keep doing these crosses. You guys can do the Punnett square. We already know that this is a, a monohybrid cross, so it, we're going to get uh, this ratio and a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, because that's the genotypic ratio. And then we can combine these. These are going to be white, not black, even though you wanted to say that they're black, because a big B would represent black. And then these are actually black. So uh, 3 fours. So one force or a three to one ratio for the phenotype. This would be white, just to mess with you, and black. Okay, so if we go back to the cross for F1, um, White buck lamb. Okay, so it could be either one of these, right? Those are both white. So it could be big B, big B, or big B, little B. We can't tell by just looking at the phenotype. Uh, determine the positive genotypes for this lamb. Okay, well, we just did that. Um, considering each of these possibilities, what are the expected offspring phenotypes? If the lamb is crossed with the heterozygous white wooled Okay, so heterozygous. So we're going to do a cross. We have to do both because we don't know which one it is. So it could be big B, big B, cross to big B, little b. Or it could be big B, little b from here cross to big B, little b. So we have to do both those possibilities. Just erase this over here. I probably should have left that up there because that's going to screw me up. Okay, so we just can do the planet square. Big B, big B, big B, little b. If you do enough of these, you'll already know that this is going to be a one-to-one -one ratio. So, um, So determine the possible genotypes. So it could, so this would be a one-to-one -one ratio if we did this cross, 
And then again, if we did this cross, it would be a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. And then again, the so that's for the, the genotype for this cross. And then you know from previous crosses that we get a 3 to 1 ratio for the phenotype. So this one would be, all of these would be white. So 100% white. And then we'd have a 1 to 1 ratio for this cross here, which is this one, uh, for big B, big B to big B, little B, 1 to 1. This one, I don't have to do the cross because I already know this is a mono hybrid. And that's always going to give me this genotypic ratio and this phenotypic ratio. So, easy enough. On to the next. Problem 7. So, problem 7. Is and Fox's silver black coat is governed by a recessive allele, uh, little b, red color by big B. So we should write that down. Big B is red, little b is uh, silver black. Okay. Determine the genotype and phenotype ratio of the spectrum from the following mating. Pure red to a carrier red. So, so we're going to, first cross we're going to do is the uh, pure red one, which is big B, big B. Carrier red one would be, when we say carrier, it means it's a heterozygote. So that's got to be big B, little B. Um, genotypic and phenotypic ratios. So again, we're just going to do crosses. So in the F1 generation for this cross, we're going to get big B, big B, and big B, little B. And that is going to be a one to one ratio for the genotype. The phenotype for these offspring is that they're all red, so 100% red, where this is one half and one half. Remember, we just don't write the two. All right, so we can go to the next one. <clears throat> so the next one says uh, carrier red to silver black. So silver black, carrier red would be uh, big B, little B, silver black is little B, little B. Again, we just do the Punnett square, little B. So again, we're going to get big B, little B, and little B, little B, and a one to one ratio. Uh, except this is going to be red and this is going to be silver black. So this is the genotypic ratio. It's also the phenotypic ratio as well. Next part, um, pure red to silver black. So again, you're just practicing doing these crosses. We know, I can already tell you that the only possible gamete this can give is a big B. Only possible gamete this can give is a little B. So the 100%, they're going to be <coughs> heterozygous and... Um, a hundred percent, they're going to be red. 
Alright. Easy enough. Alright. Um Okay, yeah, it tells you to carry me to hair wings. So that's the end of number seven. Alright, number eight. Yellow cream colored guinea pigs is produced by homozygous genotype uh, CY CY. So it, we're just it's just using a different nomenclature. This is often used uh, when you have multiple different alleles. So like maybe you have a yellow one. So this is yellow, and this is you know, red, and this is so the C is just representing color, and then the superscript is the actual color so this could be like silver and so on and so forth so that's why it's using this nomenclature cream color okay so it's cy cream Complete dominance and CW white. All right. All right. So that makes sense. So in between yellow and white, this would be incomplete. I don't know the cross yet. I do know that there's going to be a parental generation. What genotypic and phenotypic ratios are matings between cream individuals likely to produce? Okay, so C Y C W cross two C Y. Again, these are just representing alleles, so you can only pass on one allele. Um, we can do the Punnett square, and we put CY as one allele, one, allele, one uh, gamete, and CW is the other. CY is one gamete, CW is the other gamete, and we do a cross, we get CY, C, okay. C Y C W. This one is C Y C W. This one is C W. So, um, this is a monohybrid cross, but because it's incomplete dominance, we know the ratio uh, is going to be 1 to 2 to 1. So, um, it's going it to end up being 1 to 2 to 1, and we cover this in lecture. This 1 fourth <coughs> is this one? And it's going to be yellow. The two force are going to be these two. Which are going to be cream. And then the one fourth is going to be this one. Which is going to be white. What if you made a cream guinea pig with a yellow one? Alright, so we just erase this. We put a Y in there. And then we just do the cross again. This is 
this parent. This is this parent. So we get CY, 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 C. So we're going to get a one to one ratio, one half are going to be CY, CY, the other half are going to be CY, CY. And so this, these are going to be, these are going to be yellow, these are going to be cream. So half of them should be cream, half of them should be yellow. All right, Palomino horse is a hybrid exhibiting a golden color with light and, and uh, mane and tail. Combination co-dominant alleles D1 and D2 is known to be involved in the inheritance of these coat colors. So horses homozygous with D1 allele are chestnut. Horses that are have D1 and D2 are Palomino. Horses that are D2, D2 are Cremello. Okay. Two Palominos are bred multiple times. So we know that, that if we're doing the parental of Palomino ones are D1, D2. Again, subscript, superscript, it doesn't really matter. We're, we're still going to have the same Punnett square. So we're going to have a D1 gamete and a D2 gamete for each of these parents. And then we do the cross. So we're going to get a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So D1 is 1 fourth. And that one is chestnut. Is one half, and that is Palomino, and then there's one fourth, and that is Cremelli. So, uh, Palomino to non Palomino. We just add these together. We can use the rule of addition. So one fourth plus one fourth for this one is one half. And then these are palominos. So that is one half. So remember, we just don't write the numerator, the denominator. So we have a one to one ratio of palomino to non palomino.
what percentage of the non homing offspring will breed true? And they have a homozygous genotype. So um, these are true breeding because they have the same alleles. These are also true breeding because they have the same alleles. What kind of mating will produce only Palomino offspring? All right, so. So what this is asking is what parents do we need to breed? And this is useful in, in horse breeding and dog breeding and things like that. We only want Palomino. So in the F1 generation, we only want this combination of alleles. So it's pretty straightforward. If you want that combination of alleles, then you breed uh, one parent that can only provide D1 to another parent that can only provide D2. And since they each pass on one allele to the offspring, then this would be the mating that you'd want to do if you only wanted to get uh, Palomino horses. All right. Number 10. The Mexican hairless breed of dogs, the hairless condition is produced by the heterozygous genome type. So we're just going to write down the information that we have. That's hairless. Um, this is normal. This is fatal. This is this occurs in uh, Manx cats too. Um, so you have where you have a condition where it's, uh, certain things are uh, combinations of alleles are fatal. It also occurs in certain um, tabby cats as well. All right, so puppies homozygous for the H alleles are born dead. Uh, they have no ears and uh, abnormalities of the mouth. Made between hairless dogs. The average litter size is six. How many are expected to be hairless? Hairless dogs. Okay, so we just do this mating. Parental. So hairless dog try to cross to another hairless dog. <clears throat> we know that this is going to be because this is a monohybrid cross. We know it's going to be a one to two to one ratio. How many are expected to be hairless? Okay, this gets a little tricky because normally um, this would be one fourth, this would be two fourths, and this would be one fourth. But these are dead. So we can't include them in our statistical analysis. They're never born, so you wouldn't be able to wean them. So the statistical ratio is a little different when you have fatalities. So of what's remaining, we have two of these um, are going to be uh, hairless, and then one-fourth would be normal. But since these aren't going to be born, there's actually, and I can show it easier in the Punnett square. So let's do it this way. So we have big H, little h.
I know I'd made this a little more complicated than the answer. It doesn't really need to be that complicated. So these are going to die. So statistically, those are out. And so we only have three possible outcomes left. So instead of having four, the denominator has to be three because there's only three outcomes here. Of those three outcomes, we have two out of those three are going to be hairless and then one out of those three are going to be uh, normal and these are all dead so they don't count so all we have to do is multiply six by two-thirds and that gives us twelve thirds which is four right um, if we simplify that and so that we would expect four dogs to be hairless and then we can do the same thing here six times one third which would be six thirds which is two two of these dogs um, would be normal all right The pelvic anomaly of rabbits involves abnormal blood cell nuclear segmentation. Pelvers are hitters like a. Alright, so we're gonna write this down. Normal is. Again, this is the same sort of thing, so those die. If pillars are made it together, what phenotypic ratio is expected in the adult F1? So it, the problem tells you that these die shortly after birth, so the, the key is how many of these make it to adult? And in, in reality, this isn't. those aren't going to survive. So we're going to do the same sort of cross that we did on the last one. And this is a, a monohybrid cross, so we know that we're going to, again, get the exact same thing. A 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. But, again, these die. Oops. Those die. So, remember we did the Punnett square before, and this is becomes 2 thirds. Uh, and this is one third because we have the one to two to one ratio, but this one's out. So now we only have two and one, which is three. <coughs> so anyway, what phantom ratio is expected in the adult F1? So this is the adult F1 parental generation F1. We would expect two-thirds to be Helgers, one-third to be normal, and then the rest to not survive. Okay, so the next questions Are for two genes simultaneously. And I'm going to, just in case something screws up, I'm going to make this as two different parts. Okay, guys, so some of you have asked, I'm just going to do a test of this for me to do the genetics problem sets. So I was going to do that. Uh, using Microsoft Whiteboard and then upload it to YouTube. So if you're not sure what I'm talking about, um, you can open up Canvas. All 
And then if you go here to course. And to the home menu, which is default, you go down, scroll down to genetics problem set, which is here, and then and then you can download them if you click on this, or you can just look at them through the interface with Canvas. Either way. Then if we go back, <clears throat> can scroll down and see that I've also done the answers for these that I'm about to do now. And you can download them as well. Okay. So let's start. So let me just make sure that this is recording.